this morning, to be in God's presence, to be in the presence of each other, and hopefully to have an encounter with God. Let's bow our heads, be still, quiet, and pray as we go into this time of worship. Father God, our first confession is that you were here before us. Anticipating our arrival, our presence into this room, you were here waiting for us to call us into communion with yourself. It's an invitation, and the truth is, it may or may not happen. We can be in this room and not have very much communion with you if we are distracted, present only in body, not engaged in mind and heart. So our prayer this morning is that worship would indeed happen in this beautiful space, that we would come into your presence and that we would find intimacy and communion with you in the sanctuary of our mind and in our heart. These powerful words from this psalm call us to your presence with, with gratitude, with thanks, with celebration and victory. We shout before you, we make music before you, we burst into song. Help us to do those things as they've all been scripted into this worship today. Help us to participate as your people of old, as you were teaching them the elements of worship so very long ago. Help us to do the same. We pray that you would enliven us, quicken our spirit and our soul so that we could encounter you today in this time of worship. We pray in Christ's name and all God's people said together, amen. We're now in the season of Lent, so let's approach God as a penitential and reflective spirit. So we're gonna sing Kyrie Eleison, all prayer, Lord have mercy on us, remembering that God is full of mercy and that he's a good, good father. Let's stand and sing. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Who is this God who pardons all our sins? 
Hi, good morning, everyone. I would like to make a special announcement regarding organization of an appreciation supper for <clears throat> our St. George's Sunday School teachers and volunteers on the 3rd of March, the Friday evening at 7 p.m. As a small appreciation of their dedication and hard work, I would like to invite, invite all the teachers and all the volunteers who have helped with the Sunday school preparations for this supper. So we have most of the parents uh, teaching in Sunday school, but still for the dear parents who are not teaching or assisting in Sunday school, as you know that the teachers and the volunteers work every week to help your children know God's word and love. So if you would also like to thank them by making a small donation to the cost of the evening supper, you could either meet or contribute at the donation box placed near the lower hall. And also a small card will be available for you to sign today. And children can sign as well. So if you would like your name to be added to the card, you can please let me know by during the week before Friday, the 3rd of March. If you wish to give or donate, I will be in the church after service at the lower hall uh, to receive your donations, maybe by cash, or if you would like to do it by pay now, uh, you could come and see me and I can give you the details as well. We are looking forward to meet all the teachers and the volunteers for the supper to make the day a special one. And all the non-teachers and non-assistants can please come forward to sign and contribute, which would be an unforgettable moment for the teachers and the volunteers in their lives. Thanks a lot and God bless. Okay. Can all the kids come up in front so we can have a song? Yes. Children, plenty of space in front. Come right up. Okay. So this is Let Your Light Shine. So we have been singing lots of songs about shining, so we're continuing that. So remember the action for shining. So we just continue to do this. Let your light shine. Let your light shine in all the world. Okay. okay, so that everyone might see the good things you do and praise the Father in heaven. This comes from the Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. And it's telling us that we should do good things so that everybody will praise God. Okay? So shine. We want to shine. Are we ready? We ready? All right, so there's a lot of shasha, shasha shine. Okay, let's go. Shasha, 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 let your light shine. Let your light shine.
是沙沙，沙是沙沙，沙是沙沙，沙是沙。All right, kids, can you stay put for just a minute? Can you be still and quiet just for like two minutes? Well, because we want to pray for you and this hour that's upcoming uh, for Sunday school for young kids. So let's pray together, everyone. That's right. We are going to pray. Father God, uh, thank you that St. George's takes ministry to children seriously. We regard it as a sacred, holy, and reverent responsibility. We ask that you'd fill leaders and, and the followers in the next hour of Bible study with your spirit. Help us to take seriously our responsibility to teach, to lead, and reflect Christ and truth. And we pray that these young ones and our youth would experience your presence uh, through their leaders and in the activities and the readings and, the act and all that they do in this Sunday school hour. We give them in this hour to you in Christ's name. Amen. And children, you can go back to your seats or exit to Sunday school. And as they do that, would you please let's stand up and greet someone. You may share the peace. You may say, uh, the Lord be with you if you would like. But let's stand and greet someone close by. Those of you who are staying, please take your seats. And I also want to welcome, along with uh, Tom, yourselves to this service, be that in person or online. It's wonderful to be here. My name's Ian. I have the privilege of being the vicar here at St. George's. So a warm welcome, particularly if you are new. And if, you're, if you are new, you'll see in front of you, whether you're a regular or a new person, see in front of you three QR codes. If you would like to make contact with us, please scan with your phone that center one and uh, send us some information. Or if you'd like us to pray for you, we'd like to hear from you. So use that center co QR code. I'm about to give some notices and you'll so find on the left-hand side another QR code that will give you our weekly bulletin, which is refreshed each week, and that have all the details, including where to sign up for events. And if you'd like to give electronically, you can use the right-hand side one, which is a uh, light purple in color. So first notice is, my apologies if you've come just for the morning tea, uh, but I'm postponing the, the welcome morning tea until the first Sunday, sorry, the last Sunday in March. And you'll see a little later on why we're postponing that. Next is a confirmation course. So this is your very last opportunity. If you want to be confirmed this year on the 19th of March at 10.15 service, uh, you do need to sign up and to turn up uh, for our preparation, which happens online from 3 to 4 o'clock uh, this Sunday and goes for the next three weeks but uh, you do have to do these three weeks so please do sign up again you can find that information on the left hand side QR code and it will get you to confirmation and I'm going to talk in the sermon about reading God's word and doing it regularly and one of the ways to do that is to sign up to our one campaign which has been happening throughout Asia and other nations getting everyone to read the gospel of Luke here is how you do it short video Videos usually play. There we go. We can't hear now. Let's go back to the beginning of the. On what Jesus Christ has done for us. Keep going. Anyway, let's go from the start. Don't miss out on this global movement. And so we invite you to be a part. As well. 過去一年的工作都帶領很多教會去 unite together. The One Campaign is a way to take a step forward in unity, especially during Lent when we're focusing on what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
Here's how the app works. You download the app and during the period of Lent, every day you listen to a section of Luke's Gospel. You hear a devotional about that passage. You pray about the passage, but you also pray for your city. And not only that, we'll have Bible studies, we'll have sermons, we'll have a weekly film, we'll have an opportunity for you to actually feel part of our family. Not only is it made easy for you, it's an opportunity for you to connect with your people on a different level. There actually is a feeling for each one of us that we're part of something that's much bigger than just us as individuals. I would warmly invite you to make use of this one campaign this year. So let us together join our hands with all our other brothers and sisters. We want all of you to be a part of this. Don't miss such a regional movement at this time. One 2023 campaign. One 2023 campaign. Thank you, Back Row team, for getting it to work. Uh, so all you need to do is download the app. Uh, here's the QR codes. And the one closest to me is probably is the easiest. It's really easy. It gives you 10 minutes. You can either listen or read or a mixture of both. Uh, just for 10 minutes with a devotional, a prayer, the passage itself, um, and a contemplation about our city that you can pray for. Next is, uh, if you would like some teaching on one or two Samuel, or if you didn't get that QR code, if you do the left-hand side one, that'll take you there too. If you would like some information or learning about 102 Samuel uh, this coming week, you can sign up for that particular uh, um, teaching time. It's, uh, we take children teaching uh, seriously, and part of that is not only teaching them the Bible, but also keeping them safe. And so we run safeguarding courses for everybody uh, to, who's involved with children and uh, vulnerable adults. So if you would like to serve at our Sunday school, we very warmly welcome you, but you do need to do this training. It happens uh, this coming Wednesday online, so you can be uh, wherever you are. Just join with us on Zoom, 7.30 till 8.30 sharp, and then we'll give you some forms to fill out, and then you can be a, be a helper here. It's also available, if you, this course, or this um, free uh, training session, if you would just like to find out about safeguarding, because it's all our responsibility to keep everybody safe here at St George's. Next, Seniors Fellowship is going to meet this Saturday. If you feel you're a senior, you're invited. That's the, the age level. Um, and Reverend Paul is going to try and come, God willing. So if you'd like to see Reverend Paul and hear about IT training for seniors, then come and join us. We do need you to sign up because they cater, and so we know, need to know how many people are coming. Uh, next, uh, which is not uh, here on, the, on the, uh, the slides, but... If you would like to read the statement from the province of Southeast Asia, which we are a part here in Singapore, their statement on what's uh, the decision that's recently been made in the Church of England, then you can find a link to that through our website or that left-hand side QR code. Thank you. On Communion Sundays, we include in the liturgy a prayer of purity. Uh, does that mean that we only want to pray for purity like once a quarter or once a month? Well, of course not, but it's just a reminder that as we come to the table for communion, it's a reminder to take seriously our acceptance of Christ and inviting him into our lives and to search ourselves as we come to a time of repentance and confession. Uh, the prayer will be on the screen. We'll follow that by standing and recite together the Apostles' Creed. So even though we're reading aloud, let's make this our prayer as we say aloud together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we say together the Apostles' Creed. Together aloud, we say, We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living in the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Apostolic Church, the fellowship of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life eternal. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm here to sh 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 shine as well as read from Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 11. Please follow along with me. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place and will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they may, they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad you righteous, sing all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second Bible reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first witnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Amy and Grace. Who in history, whoop, I better turn this on first, otherwise it won't work. Here we go. Oh. Who in history would you most like to meet? I'm sure most of us would say Jesus because we're in church and you know that's the right answer, okay? But think of someone else other than Jesus in history. Who would you like to meet? From uh, our home, and we've got uh, two friends staying with us, I asked them that question and here are some of their answers. Jane Austen, the writer of Hebrews, male or female. Joseph, the man from Genesis that we've been studying in the last few weeks. 
J.S. Bach and Mendelssohn, the Apostle Paul. For me, I'd like to talk with Nelson Mandela. I'm fascinated by the transformation, his personal transformation from a terrorist ANC to the President of South Africa who called for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission rather than a War Crimes Commission with a death penalty. What was going on then? Who would you like to meet a person from history? But there's a bit of a problem, isn't it, in terms of meeting that person from history? Because they're history. <laughs> they're dead. So, or in Jesus' case, he's somewhere else. Uh, how do we meet people of history? Well, the way we do it, don't we, is actually we read biographies. And I was looking top 30 biographies and found this blog by Reedsy. Number one is this book, A Beautiful Mind, where the movie came from, uh, by Sylvia Nassar. Number two, sorry, it's a bit dark. The projector up there is broken down, so we're using this standby one. Uh, Alan Turing, Enigma, by uh, Andrew Hodges. Number three was this one, Alexander Hamilton, by Ron Chernow, which inspired the Broadway musical Hamilton. What I also found very interesting in this blog was their definition of what is, makes a good biography. A biography is a kind of pursuit, a writing about the pursuit of that fleeting figure, historical figure, in such a way as to bring them alive in the presence, present, rather. It's a risk, sorry, at the risk of sounding a cliche, the best biographies do exactly this. They bring their subjects to life. A great biography isn't just a laundry list of events that happen to someone, Rather, it should weave a narrative and tell a story in almost the same way that a novel does. In this way, a biography differs from the rest of nonfiction. That's the end of the quote. Now, that's a great definition, isn't it? A great definition of a good biography. Not just a set of facts, born here, there, did this, died there, uh, and when. A good biography is a story about this historical person that brings them alive, that makes them present to you. And this description here fits perfectly, I think, with a biography which was written 2,000 years ago by Luke, as Luke writes his story, his biography of Jesus. Now, over this Lent period, we're going to be examining Luke chapter 1. It's 80 verses long. And it may seem a bit strange as we talk about the, the infant stories of John the Baptist and the pronouncement of Jesus' birth, during Lent, but these 80 verses are like an overture for a musical like Hamilton or an opera or a play where we hear a sneak peek of everything that's about to come. And Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> Luke chapter 1 sets the scene for this brilliant biography for the rest of Jesus' story in the next 23 chapters. And over this year, we're going to study part of Luke, certain parts of Luke. And we're also going to study Acts as well, which Luke also wrote. <clears throat> and these chapters will bring Jesus alive. Well, not alive, because he already is alive. That's a spoiler, by the way. Uh, this biography is going to encourage us to love Jesus, to see how what he claims impacts your life and my life now, 2,000 years later. Because he is a person of history, but Luke's written this biography. That's brilliant. Luke's writing so that we may know more about Jesus and love him more and live for him because he stepped into history. And we've got uh, three points because all good sermons must have three points. It's kind of an Anglican thing, really. And we look at this overture of the overture in the first four verses. Firstly, we'll see the where of the gospel. Where did the information come from that Luke writes his biography in verses one and two? Secondly, the how of the gospel. How does Luke write his biography in verse 3? And finally, why did he write this biography in verse 4? The where of the gospel. Where does Luke get his information? Where does the truth come from is a very important question. Not just for Luke, is it? But also for us, even today. In the days of fake news, where do we gain true news? How do we discern the difference? In an era of fake texts and emails and scamming, knowing which message is true or not is important. 
And this week we've had two speeches from world leaders with opposite narratives about the war in Ukraine. Speeches from President Biden, who said the fault of the war was Russia's, and a speech from President Putin, who said it was Ukraine's fault and NATO's fault about the war. And all these speeches came on the anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine. Now note I used the word invasion, <laughs> so you can see where my lining up for the truth is. The first casualty of war is truth, is a common saying. Is truth a casualty in the Christian faith? Is the Christian faith a leap into the dark, an arbitrary decision to embrace something for which really there's no adequate reason to believe is true? Luke disagrees with that statement. Luke understands faith differently. Luke's not just content with the evidence that his friend Theophilus already has. He doesn't just merely pray that God will make it real to Theophilus. No, Luke undertakes a very heavy intellectual task. He writes a 52-chapter, two-volume book, Luke and Acts, to show how historically reliable is the facts that Theophilus and we now believe. So where does Luke get his information from? We see in verses 1 and 2. Many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Notice here two things. Firstly, the source of the details, and secondly, the details of the truth. In verse 2, we see that Paul talked to eyewitnesses, people who saw Jesus, who met Jesus, who talked with Jesus, who listened to Jesus, who touched Jesus, who were healed by Jesus. Maybe they even smelt Jesus as he went past with his body odour. It meant Luke was not just, he wasn't an eyewitness himself. He's a second generation Christian. He's like us in that sense. We may be thousands of generations later, but we, like he, didn't actually get to meet Jesus in person. Instead, Luke's gone to the primary sources for his history and talks to the people who did people who saw it, who were there. There were no Chinese whispers here in Luke's account. The message has not been distorted by generations of oral transmission from one person to person to person. I love Mark Twain's saying here, nothing spoils a good story like the arrival of an eyewitness. Because you can check out with the eyewitness whether this is true or not. They enable us to discern what is right and believable that which is fake and unbelievable. Luke has gone straight to the source of information. For example, we read later in chapter 1 that Mary was visited by the angel announcing her virginal conception. Now, no one else was there in the room, so someone had to find out, and Luke's gone to Mary to ask her those questions. What was it like? What did he say? How did you feel? And that's why when you read Luke, it's read from Mary's perspective because Luke's talked to Mary. Joseph writes from, sorry, Matthew writes from Joseph's perspective. Mary's an eyewitness, and so Luke goes and talks to her as he writes his biography of Jesus. Notice also in verse 1, Luke mentions that there are other people who've written their first-hand reports of Jesus. There are other sources available to Luke, not just eyewitnesses. And Luke here is suggesting that Theophilus could also look at their material as well and compare and contrast with Luke's. Now, we don't have all that Luke had, but we certainly have Mark and Matthew. Mark's account was certainly available to Luke. Mark was probably written first. And sometimes you can compare Luke and Mark's gospel because they're identical in places, but some places they're different. Here's one example I love. Notice first that Luke is a doctor. He's a medical doctor. And if you remember uh, two weeks ago, I talked about um, how trustworthy doctors is, are. And uh, Luke, uh, not only a medical doctor, he's writing in this healing miracle about a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years without stopping. So is Mark. Mark mentions here the outcome of this woman's hope in doctors. No better, no money left. All due to the doctors. Luke who used Mark as a source document, leaves out any mention of doctors. 
and their success rate on her healing rather generalizes like no one was able to look after heal her. So these sort of changes, identical and yet different, give me confidence about the truth of the biographies of Jesus because they indicate no collusion, no sitting down, no large-scale plagiarism. Eyewitnesses won't agree, on, won't agree on every little detail. They'll just tell the story from their perspective. But their main event will agree. And so you, Luke uses sources and talks to eyewitnesses. This is the where of his biography. He's saying it is a very truthful account. It's reliable. You can trust it. You can build your life on it. It's certain. Sorry again about the, the darkness there. Benjamin Franklin, he said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. And they're certainly certain, death and taxes. But the truth of Jesus is certain as well, says Luke in his biography. So that's why I've been encouraging you to take up the one campaign and read Luke's gospel over this period of Lent, 10 minutes a day from Monday to Saturday. As I said, it's really easy to do. All you need to do is download the app and it push play and it will talk to you or you can read the words as well. It's worth doing. And then when Lent's finished, don't just stop at Luke. Read Matthew and Mark and John. And then what happens uh, after Jesus leaves in the book of the, the Acts of the Apostles? And read Paul's letters and James's letters and Peter's letters. And then read the background context of Jesus, the Old Testament, and all the promises about Jesus there. Lifetime of reading, worth it, because it's truth about who Jesus is and about the Christian faith. So we've learnt about the where from Luke's material. Now go to our second point, the how of Luke's gospel. How does Luke write his gospel with his material? Verse 3. With this in mind, says Luke, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Luke writes with thoroughness. Notice he, he, he himself have investigated this. Remember, he's gone. He's a trustworthy doctor. He comes across as a trustworthy doctor. He's investigated. So he's not just a doctor, he's also an investigative journalist as well. And not only is Luke thorough, but he's also accurate. He's carefully investigated. Not just investigated, but carefully investigated. He would have checked and double-checked all that he found. The wealth of over a hundred years now of archaeological discoveries has shown how true Luke is to history, how accurate he is, how correct to details. For example, look at this in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He's going in the extra mile to state exactly who was around at the time or what period of time it was. In the fifth year of the reign of Tiberius, the Caesar of Rome, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eritrea and Trachonitis, and Lysania Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas. <laughs> He's, he could have just mentioned one name, but he mentions all of them. He's saying, what I'm saying is true and accurate and is history. History that's been carefully investigated. He makes not only a good doctor, a good journalist, but also a good historian. He writes what is a true and accurate record, not just the minutes of the meeting, but what actually happened in the life of Jesus. And Luke delivers to Theophilus, whose name means friend of God, something that's trustworthy that Theophilus can build his life on. And friends, if we too want to be friends with God, this is a way we can base our life on. This is an account, a biography of the story of Jesus. That is true. Theophilus is a Greek name. Luke is a Greek. He's writing to a non-Jewish person. If you're Jewish, then Matthew's a great gospel. But if you're non-Jewish, then Luke's an excellent gospel, a biography. It's a good one to, for you to read because most of you will be non-Jews. It's good for you to read with other people who are non-Jews. It's good for you to give to other people to read about Jesus. Luke is thoroughly accurate and writes his account in an orderly manner. Now, orderly doesn't mean chronologically, but it does mean he's used themes or movements, particularly there's one big movement from chapter 9 to 19 as Jesus heads towards Jerusalem, goes to where he knows he's going to die. 
And we're going to study some of those passages later on in the year as well. You see, Luke writes not just a laundry list of facts and statements of of truth about Jesus, like the Apostles' Creed, they're statements of fact. Luke writes about Jesus, the person whom he wants you and I and Theophilus to know, and the certainty of those claims. So Luke's told us about the where his information come from, how he puts together, and finally, why he writes this, verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Luke is not writing history simply for history's sake. He's not writing archaeological details for the sake of archaeology. I can't even say the word, archaeology. Nor is he writing simply as a window into the socio-economic uh, section of, uh, in Palestine in the first century. Luke is unashamedly saying, this is a biography with a moral aim. He wants to bring to Theophilus and to us the true and certain knowledge of the truth of Jesus and of Christianity. Our world is full of competing truth, isn't it? About voices from God, of, of God. Each religion stakes its claim, sometimes with a book. It's the Quran in Islam, Tanakh as for Jews, Upanishads for Hinduism, Sutras for Buddhism, the Book of Mormon. Which one's correct? Who is right? Luke is saying, for all of us in the 21st century, as well as Theophilus back in the first century, and all the centuries in between and the ones after uh, us, we can have the Bible. And in the Bible is a biography of Jesus that is sure and certain and accurate. With my record of Jesus, says Luke, I'll offer you certainty. Here's something which is rock solid upon which you can build your life. A promise to hold on to. A hope to long for that will fully you will be completely realized. Quoting John Piper about this. Certainty of the kind of the reality that's locked down, secure, safe, stable, unchanging. I write my gospel, says Luke, that you may know the safety, the maximum security, the certainty of what you've been taught. These things are safe from being stolen, safe from being changed, safe from, un, uh, from ceasing to be what they are. Safe from becoming unimportant or irrelevant. Safe from being not reality anymore. These things, Theophilus, will always be. These things, you and I, they will always be. It's the kind of knowing that caused the church to survive throughout the centuries of frequent and terrible persecution. It's the kind of knowing that's immovable in the face of disease or abandonment or disillusionment or grief or martyrdom. Now, two weeks ago, I told you of Meryl and Mai's plan to go to Langkawi, a holiday in uh, Malaysia. It was a wonderful week, absolutely wonderful. We relaxed, we explored, we swam, we chilled, watching sunsets outside our hotel beach. I didn't want to come back, but I'm glad to be back with you. But then we did come to a terrible week this week, absolutely awful week. One sad aspect was the funeral services, uh, the passing of one of our members from 8 o'clock, Pearl Kiram Mathipathy. She was 92, a lovely lady. Another was an aspect of uh, Norella and my week that was difficult and continues to be so, rocking what we thought was certain. And I'm sure you've had weeks like that, contrasting weeks. And when those happen, you and I, we need something certain, don't we? Something to hang on to something to pin our life to, some certainty, protection, some hope, some unchanging love and protection, despite the circumstances. Because circumstances change quickly, don't they? Unplanned for, unwanted, unhelpful. Health can change quickly, financial situations can change quickly, jobs can change quickly. Things we own can break down or be lost or stolen or decay. We have no certainty in those things. But we can in God. We can in Jesus. We can in Luke's account of Jesus. And so Luke, words from Jesus, spoke right into my situation this week, in this particular verses, from Luke 12, 22 to 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. 
Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Well, friends, you may be worrying about other things. What to say when following Jesus is difficult. Luke 12, verse 11. When you're brought before synagogues, says Jesus, or rulers or authorities, don't worry about how you would defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Or maybe you're concerned about death and about salvation and where you'll be. What happens after death? Listen to the thief on the cross again from Luke, this time chapter 23, verse 42. The thief who's about to die, he's hanging beside on Jesus on that cross. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, before you do, he dies, before the thief, that is, Jesus is going to die. But still, Jesus can still say, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We can know the certainty of heaven because of Jesus and Luke's account of So Luke, in the face of uncertainty, wants us to come right out to us and say, crystal clear, this is why I'm writing my book, that you, Theophilus, Ian Hadfield, insert your name, the certainty that you can have knowing the things that you've been taught, it's true. Hang on to it. Luke writes to us, and so we can read. What I've written, you'll see about the facts on which Christianity is based. And you'll find something there firm and solid, absolutely trustworthy, a place to find hope. So which historical person would you like to meet? Jesus wants you to meet Jesus, the true Jesus. Have you met him? Have you heard him or read at least his words? Read Luke. Come and join our Alpha course or our Christianity Explored course later in the week. Talk to a Christian. Come and talk to me. And if you do know Jesus, then read his word, read about him, and you'll grow to love him and want to serve him more and more wholeheartedly. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your life and your words and your healings and your miracle, your death and the greatest miracle of all, the resurrection. Thank you. God, for Luke, that he wrote this, that he took this uh, in hand and wrote such a wonderful account. Thank you for Theophilus, who probably helped pay for what Luke did so that we might have that certainty as Theophilus could have too. Help us to build our life upon the solid rock, which is Christ and his word. We thank you, Lord, that you've had your word translated from Hebrew and Greek into a language we can understand, be that English or any other language. Thank you for things like the One Campaign that help us to read your word so we might grow in faith, in hope, and in love. For Jesus' sake we pray, and for the good of our lives. Amen. Friends, would you please stand? Because we now want to respond, this time in song, All I Once Held Dear, I Turn Now to Serve Christ.
to know. Oh, to know. When you do this, think of me, search yourself before you remember my body and my blood. This is a part of our worship and also preparation for communion we'll share in a moment. Can we say together and pray together uh, the words of confession and assurance that will be before you? Together aloud we say, Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Of the many assurances in the Old and the New Testament, Psalm 85, 6-5 says of God, you are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. And in Colossians 1.14, we read, In Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. Holy Lord, everything we need is found in you. For those of us who come here feeling broken, bring restoration. For those of us who come here feeling weak, bring strength. For those who come here weeping, bring joy. For those who come here with doubts, bring faith. For those who come here feeling burdened, bring rest. And for those who come here feeling anxious, bring peace. And now, Father, we lift up the troubles of the world to you. We pray for the nation of Austria. While many believe in God, few know Jesus personally. We pray for open hearts to discover Jesus in new places and for the further growth of the renewal movement within the church. We pray for a multiplication of congregations that honor and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. We lift up Turkey and Syria in the aftermath of the devastating earthquake. With more than 26 million homeless, we pray against the spread of infectious diseases arising from poor hygiene and sanitation. We pray that relief supplies may reach those in urgent need of food, water, medication, and medicine and shelter. 
Here in Singapore, we lift up President Madam Halimayako, our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, and the government. We pray that Singapore will remain a united and strong nation where different races and cultures can coexist harmoniously, integrate our diversities, and channel them towards common aspirations and goals. We thank you, Father, for those who work in the area of music. We pray that they may work for God's glory in creating beautiful music and cultivating the love of music. Please grant them your wisdom, inspiration, and blessing in their work. We also pray that the season of Lent will be a time of self-examination, deep reflection, and thoughtful meditation on God's word, that the Holy Spirit will guide us to repent of our sins and pursue holiness in our lives. Within St. George's, we lift up our overseas mission partner, Hope Project Laos. We thank you for Matt and Laurie Mann. Please continue to bless the work that they do. Today, we pray specifically for another house mother and home for the girls. We also pray for the young boy who is autistic and suffering from eczema. Please give his carers wisdom in knowing how to communicate with him and help him. We ask for your guidance and wisdom in deciding how to best help the three children who will need a safe place to live if their mother dies. We also pray for our H2O Youth Ministry as they go through the Life of Jesus video series. We pray for the Dig Deeper program. We pray that our youth will grow in their understanding of the Bible, what it means to be a follower of Christ, and how to apply this in their daily lives. We thank you for our Filipino Fellowship and pray for wisdom and strength for Heidi, Maricel, Efren, and Rex, who will be leading Bible studies on Sundays. Please continue to protect them and strengthen their faith and love for one another. Thank you for the growth in this ministry. Please also bless the Thursday night meetings at Pandan Valley and the Friday night Zoom small groups that Heidi leads. We now pray for those within our community who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We lift up Anna Lily, Jayanti, Jacqueline, Joanna, Reverend Paul and T. Dai, and also those we don't know by name. We pray for your comfort, peace, and healing to be upon them. Please also bless their family members and caregivers with love, patience, and grace. Please shower the Kira Mathi Pathi family with your love and your comfort as they grieve the loss of Pearl earlier this week mother to John, grandmother to Emmanuel and Nicholas, and great-grandmother to Adriel and Alora. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now say the Collect together. It's on the screen. Collect for the first Sunday in Lent. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ fasted 40 days in the wilderness, and was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ as Saviour and Lord. And we particularly have students here with us from Laos, from Mongolia, and from India, who we warmly welcome to. We come together because of Christ and what he's done for us, and remind ourselves of his death and his resurrection and his promise to come back. 
So therefore, slide snakes, lift your, up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give him thanks and praise. It's indeed right. It's our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. And now we give you thanks because through him you have given us the spirit of discipline, that because Christ has triumphed on the cross, that we might triumph over evil and grow in grace. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and your glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We can only come to Christ because of his great love. So let's admit that in this prayer together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We're not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in your turn to mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. And he made there a full atonement for the sins of the whole world, offering once and for all his one sacrifice of himself. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his most precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, and our communion packs, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of the death that he suffered, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. When that same night that he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave you thanks, he then broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Now, one of the things we don't have when we come forward is to, we don't, and sitting in our seats by ourselves, we don't have that community feeling. So I'm going to ask you to do some things slightly different this time. So would you please remove the first seal and take out the wafer? And thank the Lord for Jesus and for his death for you. Eat this, remembering Jesus' body broken for you, and feed upon him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You may eat. And remove the second seal. And this time I want you to pray for the people beside you, left and right. You might not even know their name, but pray for them too, that they might serve the Lord Jesus. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and for your neighbour and live lives of thankfulness. You may drink. And you'll find rubbish bins on your way out where you can put your refuse. So together as a community, as our Saviour taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And a prayer now for us as we go and serve the Lord, knowing the truth, the certainty of our faith. Together we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies 
to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. My friends, I invite now uh, Peter Tan, who's the Vicar's Warden, to make an announcement uh, to you all. Um, this, these words come from the Bishop of Singapore, but Peter's delivering them. It is with uh, sadness that I announce today that the Diocese of Singapore has decided not to renew Reverend Ian Hatfield's S-Pass which expires in early August 2023. The decision has not been taken lightly and has been done after much prayer and reflection. There are two primary reasons for this decision. First, it is timely for the diocese to be transitioning towards local vicar leadership for all parishes within the Archdeaconry of Singapore. Secondly, the diocese believes that in a post-pandemic phase, this decision would also potentially release available resources for deployment and stewardship in other needful areas of ministry within the parish. It is also important to emphasize that this outcome is not a reflection on Ian or his leadership of the parish. The diocese recognizes that Ian and his family have been a great blessing to the church community in St. George's, as well as the larger diocese and family. We will always remember Ian's many contributions, and the Hatfields will always be part of the extended family of St. George's Church. At this time, let us uphold the Hatfields in prayer as they contemplate the opening of a new chapter and season of ministry after they leave us. Xiaoming and I, will be happy to address any questions and comments that you might have. The wardens and vicar are scheduled to meet the bishop, Bishop Titus, on the 21st of March, and we will continue to keep you informed of all developments. Please continue to uphold the Hatfields and St. George's in prayer. We also pray for Bishop Titus as he deliberates over and chooses the next vicar for St. George's. Let us bring this matter to the Lord as I say a short prayer. Lord, we take hold of your words in Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Lord, we lay before you St. George's as we find ourselves now in a state of transition and some uncertainty. Continue to guide and direct your church to act wisely in love in accordance with your ways. Be with Bishop Titus as he deliberates on the new vicar for St. George's. Be with Ian and Narell as they consider the way forward. Grant them your peace and direct their paths. We know that we can pray all this because you are a good, good father and so we can lean on your everlasting arms. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So uh, that's why it was a bad week. <laughs> I now understand what it's like to be made redundant in a new and fresh way. But as, Paul, as P Peter said, we're leaning on the Lord's everlasting arms and we'll certainly be praying for you and Bishop Titus uh, in the future. So we'll be finishing by um, the... Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, Narelle's not here. She's teaching Sunday school, so you better see her and clap for as long too, because <laughs> she's feeling also uh, pained. But we lean on an everlasting God. We trust in Him. We we know He's got a good plan for us and for you. We're just not so sure, so sure and certain, but we are sure and certain in Him. So, would you please stand as we sing this closing song, leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm 
fellowship. Now that Ian has introduced Mark Twain quotes to worship, I have to share my favorite one, and it goes like this, represented in the form of a magnet on my refrigerator. When I was a lad of 14, my father was so ignorant I could barely stand to have the old man around. But by the time I was 21, I was astonished how much he had learned. <laughs> Think about that. <clears throat> A book I recently finished said, human beings are like downed trees scattered here and there by the hurricanes of the world. We're uprooted. This world does violence to the soul in so many ways. Primary goal of the enemy is to keep us from union with God. The world is the devil's puppet intended to prevent union with God simply by keeping you distracted and haggard. Yet worship, communion with God, this thing that we're about to end, is intended to heal, restore, and mend that rift, the fractures in our soul so that we can have daily, personal, intimate oneness with God. So much through the scriptures, but so profoundly in the Psalms 23, he refreshes my soul, he restores my soul, and guides me along paths for his name's sake. So as we go, remember, our worship service has ended, but our worship of God continues. Therefore, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Oh.
May his grace and his faith shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace. May the Yeah.